before God this morning uh, as we uh, present ourselves to Him and then ask Him to help us to glean everything that we can from His Word and become exactly what He wants us to be. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse number 1. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. Verse 3 says, And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. I'm going to preach about this this morning, the presence of God. I don't know if, if, you, if this, this is a, a reality to you. I want, it, I want it to be, and I hope that it will be. Uh, but we want to be in the presence of God. We are in the presence of God, but is the presence of God real to you? And that's what I want to preach about this morning. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we are so grateful. You've been so very good to us. And we are so unworthy of your grace and your mercy and your love. It is beyond our even ability to understand it, how gracious and merciful you've been to us. This morning we come with this thought and this idea about your presence, and we've come into your presence this morning at, at your house to worship you, to acknowledge you, and to humble ourselves before you. Teach us from your word. Might your Holy Spirit have free course in our lives, and might he teach and instruct, uh, and might your presence be made known in each and every one this morning. Father, if there's anyone in this room, anyone in, under the, the sound of my voice this morning that does not know you in a personal way, and that your, your son has not uh, has not come into their heart, and you have not, they have not called on you for salvation because of what he's done for them. I pray that today would be the day that they realize their need for you and for what you've done for them. And they might know your love through Christ, and that you might bring salvation to a heart today. We ask for your grace and your mercy and your help, and we plead that as we come into your presence, we pray that you would teach us and guide and direct us, and might our worship be, be honorable to you, and might we come with a humble heart to you this morning and come into your presence with singing and praises. Thank you now for all you've done. Thank you for what you're going to do. And we ask for your grace and mercy and help in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The presence of God. The presence of God. Do you, and this is, I just want you to think about this for a moment. We're going to get into our text in a few minutes, but I, I want you to think about something. Do you, as a person, sense, know the presence of God in your day-to-day -day life? Is God's presence real to you? And I'm not just talking about right here, right now. I hope that it is right here, right now. I hope that through the, the, the Sunday school hour this morning and, and into this hour and with the singing and, and everything, that you somehow have sensed the presence of God. But the question is, will you sense it tonight when you lay your head on your pillow? Will you sense it tomorrow when you get up and, and head out into your day? Will you sense it on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday? Will, do you sense it in your life every day, His presence? Now, I'm not asking you, just to be clear, if you know the truth that God is present with you. I'm asking you if you know the presence of God in your life. Because there's a difference. We can know something to be so, but not experience it to be so. I want you to listen to some verses as I read them for you. You can jot these down. It would be a great thing to do and consider. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 13, the Bible says, Know ye not that the temple, uh, that ye, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, think about what that verse means. I am the temple of God. This is not God's temple. 
this building, these two by fours, these walls and this roof. That's not God's temple. This is God's temple. Beyond that, you are God's temple. Your body is the temple of God. If you know Jesus as your Savior, uh, He's taken up residence in your heart. He has become a uh, part of you. You're the temple of God. And the Spirit of God dwells in you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. It asks the question, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Goes on to say, you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He's saying this, God's presence, he's not, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Getting ahead of myself there a little bit, but for 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16, 2 Corinthians 6, 16. What agreement hath the temple of God, my body, with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Do you know the presence of God daily, hourly, moment by moment in your life? <clears throat> I hope that you don't only sense the presence of God when you come to church. Now, I hope you do sense it when you come to church. But I hope that's not the only time you sense it. In fact, my hope, and I believe God's prayer and God's desire and design is that you sense His presence with you every day, every moment, all the time, that there is not any time in your day, night or day, that you do not know and sense the presence of God in your life. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14 says, That good thing which was committed unto thee, Keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. He dwells there. He becomes a part of my life when I become a Christian. When I become a follower of His, I am uh, experienced a new birth in Christ, and He will never leave me. In fact, Hebrews 13, 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For He has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. See, here's the truth. When we become a follower of Christ, Christ becomes an indweller of us. The Holy Spirit of God never leaves my presence. But that does not prevent me, nor does it prevent you, from forgetting that, or worse, ignoring His presence. Some ten times in our lives... We get so busy, so wrapped up in life that we, we don't even realize, we don't recollect. It's not in the forefront of our minds that God is right there. He's not somewhere afar off. He's not just sitting on a throne in heaven. He's not just seated at the right hand of the Father. He is right here with me all the time. No matter where I go, no matter what I do, my God is with me always. And while the truth of His presence may be known, the reality of His presence may be lost day by day and moment by moment. And such was the case in our text in, in 1 Samuel chapter 3. Eli had lost the peace of God and the presence of God. Now consider this, Eli was the high priest. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what position you hold. There are people uh, uh, that are in God's religious service, that are in God's uh, service as far as in His church service and in His ministry service and missionaries on the field and pastors uh, in, in their office and, and deacons and, and individuals in His church that have forgotten the presence and they've lost the presence of God in their day-to-day -day life. It becomes just a job to them, just something that they're doing. And that's where Eli's at, as we find him in our text this morning. He was not in touch with God. He was not in communication with God. And, he, and, the, and the presence of God was not sensed in Eli's life in this point in time. I imagine at some point it was earlier in his life and earlier in his ministry. Uh, God's presence was known to him. But as we find him in our text here, 
His presence is not known. It says in verse number 1, And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And Eli had laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Now, God wasn't speaking to people as he had in the past and as he would in the future. And I don't believe for a second, I don't believe for a moment that it was because God had nothing to say. I think more likely it was their ears they had stopped and their eyes they had closed. In other words, it was there was nobody interested and there was nobody listening. Let me read to you Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7. We spent some time in Isaiah this morning. Isaiah challenges the people there, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let them return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Listen, Isaiah makes this observation. He makes this statement. You need to come back to God. God hasn't went anywhere. He is right there. He is right here. God didn't leave me. I've left him. I have forsaken him. I have forgotten him. If I get to a place in my life, spiritually or, or otherwise, where I am no longer practicing the presence of God right there with me, then God hasn't left me. I, friends, have left him. In a time when he should have been searching, Again, God was silent. God was, was not speaking to Eli. Nobody uh, was hearing the voice of God. And of all people, of anyone that should have been hearing from God, it should have been Eli. Living there at the temple, ministering there at the temple, his job as a high priest would have, uh, would have been one that he would have been going between the people and God and, uh, and, and offering their sacrifices and beseeching God on their behalf. But he wasn't, and he didn't even hear the voice of God. It, if it happens to Eli, it could happen to any one of us. And the truth of the matter is, it's probably happened to all of us. At some time or another, perhaps even now, we're not living in, the, in practicing the presence of God in our, in our daily lives. We're going on about our life, we're, we're going on about our activities, and we take no thought of God. Uh, and we take no thought of, has he spoken to me? Ha, ha, has he taught me anything? Is there anything going on in my life that would show me that God's working and active in my life today? And so here we find Eli, but God's not speaking to him. He's not hearing from God. He's not seeking God. But then we see the, the, uh, this young man, Samuel. In verse number 3, we're introduced to Samuel here. Um, in verse number 1, in fact, Samuel uh, ministered unto the Lord before Eli. Here we have a young man. His mother had prayed for a, a child to be given her, and, he said, I, and she said, I will dedicate that child to you if you'll give me a, a man-child. And he, uh, God answered her prayer, and she brought him back as a, a very young child and, and handed him over to Eli. And Eli raised him uh, in, the, in the house in the service of the Lord. And this young Samuel ministered there unto the... Notice this. The child Samuel, verse number 1, ministered unto the who? The Lord before Eli. Now that's going to be a, a big part of, of what we're talking about this morning. I want you to notice. In verse number 3, the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, and there was an ark of God uh, uh, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. But notice in verse number 4, and the Lord called unto Samuel. And he answered, Here am I. 
And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, thou hast, uh, for thou hast called me. And he said, I called thee not, uh, I called not, rather lie, again, uh, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And verse 6, the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son. Lie down again. Verse 7, now Samuel did not know yet or did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. He's a young child, a young man. Verse 8, and the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, thou shalt, uh, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called at the other time, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. He didn't speak to Eli the high priest, but he spoke to Samuel, this young child. The fact that God spoke to Samuel is not surprising, considering that in verse number 1, it says that Samuel ministered to the Lord and before Eli. Samuel was interested in pleasing the Lord. He was interested in serving God. He was interested in hearing from God. While no one else was. Verse number 3, I want you to notice this. What had happened? It says in verse three, and aired the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. That God inserts for us this little detail. He says the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. <laughs> you see, Eli hadn't heard from God in a long time, but Samuel did. Eli could identify that it was God calling to him because at one time he had heard from God. But something happened. Something happened to cause Eli to stop hearing and Samuel to start hearing. And let me point out that this verse 3 gives us a clue. It says, The lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. What does that mean? What does that have to do with it? Well, see, Eli, as the, the priest, had a responsibility. His job, one of the details of his job, was to keep that lamp full of oil. It was supposed to burn continually, according to Exodus 27, 20, and 21, and Leviticus 24, one, uh, 2 through 4. In fact, let me read Leviticus 24, uh, verses 2 and 3. Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil, olive, beaten for light, and to cause the lamps to burn continually without the veil of the testimony. In the tabernacle of the congregation shall Aaron order it from the evening unto the morning. From when? The evening unto the morning before the Lord continually it shall be a statute forever in your generations sam or eli failed to be faithful in his duties the oil in the bible represents the presence of the holy spirit it's it's, it's a, a synonym it's a representation oil in the bible represents the holy spirit fire speaks of god's presence and god's power and god's working the oil being filled in the lamp and the fire that's burning there represented the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, and it meant, represented the power of God uh, and the presence of God through the fire. But Eli let the fire go out. Just like many of us let the fire go out in our spiritual lives. How much time did we spend in prayer this morning? How much time did we spend seeking God this morning? How much time this week have we spent? How much time tomorrow will you spend seeking God? And how much time will you spend adding the oil? See the Holy Spirit represented by the oil. Uh, but Eli had to seek that. He had to make sure that it was filled. Will you step into the presence of God? 
Will you bow and worship before him uh, every day in, in your daily life? The lamp of God represented the presence of God in their lives, but Eli didn't keep it filled. And God's presence was not known to him, and it was not known to others because he failed to be faithful in his duties uh, in the house of God. He laid down at night without filling the lamps. He laid down at night without taking the oil that represents the Holy Spirit and putting it in the lamp to make sure the lamp continued to burn so that the presence of God continued to be represented in, in, in his people and in that temple and in his life. How often have we f failed to fill the lamp? How often has the, 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 the lamp of God burned out in our lives and we have not sensed the presence of God there? Do we go through an entire day without hearing from God? Do we go through an entire week without hearing from God? Are we ministering unto the Lord in hopes to hear from Him as, as Samuel was? Or have we just kind of laid the torch down? Have we laid the, the responsibilities down? Have we laid the, uh, the, the, that down in our life like Eli has? Listen, the truth of the matter is, if we seek, we shall find. If we knock, it shall be open. If we're listening, God will speak. If we're being faithful in our duties to the Lord in and outside of his house, then he will continue and his presence will continue and we'll continue to sense that presence. We're in danger today of being so busy I'm going to speak something right now that we need to hear. We're in danger in our lives right now, you and me, of being so busy in our lives that we don't have time to refill the oil to keep the lamp burning of God's presence in our lives. There may not be today a physical lamp. There is not a physical lamp to fill but that lamp is still represented in our lives. The Bible says, we read it earlier, you are the temple. I am the temple. Are we continuing in the presence of God? Are we continuing to, to bow in His presence? Are we continuing to, to seek His presence? Do we continue to read His Word and study His Word, examine His Word, learn and understand His Word? Are we continuing to take the time? Listen, I, I looked at the, at the news this morning. I watched uh, the, the uh, articles about uh, the impeachment of our former president or the attempt thereof. I, I've looked at uh, what the snow was going to do and what the weather was going to do. I've looked at all those things. Listen, sometimes we get so busy looking at what's going on in the world, we forget all about the things of God. But we've got to refill the oil. In here, through here, we've got to come into his presence. We've got to seek that. Just like Isaiah told the peop people in Isaiah 55. Jump back with me here. We're looking at 1 Samuel chapter, uh, in fact, jump back to chapter 2 with me. Because one of the problems is we're, th th one of the things that has happened is that previous generations have failed in practicing the presence of God and refilling the oil and, and, and the presence of God in their life, and, and the future generations have been lost. There are people today in our society today who were raised in church, raised around church, no longer in church. In fact, through COVID, I saw a study a, a couple weeks ago as a result of this past year's COVID uh, situation. Most millennials, I think they, they refer to those as 20 to 30 year olds or something like that. That age group, majority of them have dropped out of church completely. I see it in our own church. A lot of them have dropped out. In the 
the next age, the 40 to 50 age group, uh, there was a, a significant decline. In just about every age group, there were folks that stopped going to church altogether. You know why? Because they pr- stopped practicing the presence of God in their life. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 2. I want you to notice with me verse number 12. Notice what happened here. And it says, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. Now understand what I just read. Eli's sons, the high priest's sons, the descendants of Aaron. Now Aaron and his sons served God, but two of his sons burnt strange fire on the altar of God and were killed by God for doing that because God told them not to do that. They did it anyway. But Aaron and his other two sons continuing to serve the Lord. Uh, Here we have Eli, the high priest, and he's got two sons, and they're sons of Belial, they're sons of Satan. And I'm not even going to get into what they were doing. It was wretched, it was wicked, it was ungodly. Uh, and, and, And by the way, you could read about such things in the newspaper today. Nothing new under the sun. But Eli lost his children. Because he failed to fill the oil in his own life. He failed to represent God in his own life. He failed to acknowledge God in his own life. He failed to show that and demonstrate that and and teach that to his kids. And they became kids of Belial, kids of Satan inside the temple. When people came to offer their offering before the Lord and, and, and uh, make a sacrifice before the Lord, uh, it was the practice, it was the right thing, it was prescribed in the Word of God that part of that animal was to go to uh, the priest and his children for them to eat. That's how they ate. That's what they ate. His sons were so corrupt that when somebody showed up, they would require certain portions and they would require it prepared a certain way even though God said that's not the way it was supposed to be done. They were... They had, they had no sense of respect for God, for God's house or God's people because they had lost the presence of God in their life because their father had lost the presence of God in his life. I'm thankful for my kids. I'm thankful that they still serve the Lord. I'm thankful that, uh, that uh, Rachel's on the mission field and serving God and, uh, and seeking the Lord and seeking to influence people with, in their relationship with the Lord. But I pray that as the rest of my children grow up, I'm, I'm not even halfway through raising my kids yet. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's very real to me. This, this passage and this incident in the Bible, Eli and his son, is a very scary thing for this preacher. Because there's a lot of preacher's kids that are sons of Belial. But I don't want it to be mine. But if I don't want my kids to be sons of Belial, I can't do what Eli did, and that is to let the the fire go out. I've got to keep the oil uh, filled in the lamp. I've got to continue practicing the presence of God in my life. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's just as hard for me as it is for you. I know the reality of that. I know the reality of the challenge that Eli faced. The world is a wicked place to, to... to grow up in. It's a wicked place to grow old in. It's a wicked place to to raise a family in. Satan and his demons are hiding around every corner, it seems, trying to get us to to go the way of the world. More about that in this afternoon's message. I hope that you'll tune in or, or come back for that. In verse number 12 here, did I read all of that? Yes. They knew not the Lord. Jump down with me to verse 22. It says, Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how that, notice this, they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Tabloid material right there. Verse 23, And he said unto them, why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings with, uh, by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear ye make the Lord's people to transgress. 
It says in verse 25, If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would, uh, would slay them. And that's what happened. God killed them. God allowed them to be killed. They were worldly. They were wicked. They were leading men and women to despise God and, 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 uh, and sin in their life. They are the consequences of not keeping the oil filled and not keeping the lamp burning in Eli's life and in his family life. Proverbs 22, 6, a verse that many of you might know, says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. There's a lot of folks who say, oh, that doesn't work. I tried it. Hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of us just try what we don't do. We need to keep the oil filled in the lamp. We need to keep God's presence in our lives, and, and we need to keep the fire burning so that our children can see it in our lives. Eli failed in his testimony and his example before his children. He was not practicing the presence of God. Now listen, there are there's some folks, there are some folks that say, Oh, but my children, it, it's, it, it was their friends. It was their friends' fault. They were hanging around with the wrong crowd. Who's supposed to help determine the friends of my children? My kids don't pick their friends. I'm not saying that, I, I, all I'm saying is this. My kids will pick the friends that I train them to pick that I brought them up to pick. And when there's people in their lives that so-called friends that are not living by, uh, in, a, in a way that they've learned to live and they've learned is right to live, then they ought to know, hey, there's something wrong with this. Who helps determine what the right kind of friends are, the right kind of friends to have? The parents should. Well, it was them kids at school who sent the kids to that school. Train up a child in the way that he should go. When he's old, he won't depart from it. I realize the society today says that, that you, you've got to send your kids to the school because, I mean, you can't do that on your own. That's a bunch of nonsense. You, you don't have to send them to their schools. You don't have to let them teach them and, uh, and train them and educate them in, in lies and falsehoods. Well, it was that TV programming. Man, the, the pro, TV programming today is just not what it used to be. <laughs> Who turned that TV on and let them watch it? And it was them video games that they played. That's where it was. Who bought them video games? Who allowed those video games? I'm just saying this. Eli lost his kids. He didn't keep the oil burning. He didn't keep the presence of God before his children. And they turned out wicked. Today, we need, we're going to lose the next generation if we don't keep the lamps burning, if we don't keep the presence of God real. Parents, if you're not involved in your young people's lives, helping them to discern right and wrong, keeping the presence of God before their eyes. If you're not showing them an example of how to walk with the Lord and how to respect the presence of God, they're going to turn out just like Eli's kids. Don't let the oil run dry. Don't let the lamp go out. We need to practice the presence of God in our lives and in our families' lives, before our family, with our family. Otherwise, the oil is going to run dry and the lamp's going to go out. And the next generation is going to be lost. I praise God for Samuel. He was, he was serving, he was listening. I'm thankful that in spite of the fact that he was raised in the same household as these two wicked men, that he still sought to serve the Lord before Samuel. So that when God was ready to speak to him, he was ready to hear. I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you, I want to plead with you. 
teaching on worship. Why am I doing that? Because I believe it's vitally important as we move forward in this generation that we're in with the, 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 the surroundings that we have going on today, with the, the way that our culture's going, the way that uh, the things are happening in, our, in the day that we're living in, we had better get some serious worship going on. We had better fill the lamps and we had better get back into the presence of God and we better practice that presence every day. Because one of these days, we may not have a, a building like this to meet in. We might have to meet out on the farm under a tree. Oh, that'll never happen, and that's exactly how it'll happen. We'll think it'll never happen. Do you think Eli ever thought his kids was going to grow up that way? I don't think his wife and, and, and he set out to have them that way. I think they got that way because he began letting his guard down. He began uh, not refilling the oil. Well, it'll go out. I'll refire it up in the morning. Friends, you can't, we can't afford to do that. We need to practice the presence of God in our lives every day. I am bought with a price. I should glorify God in my body and in my spirit, which are God's. Whether I come to the house of God or I'm there with my family in our home, uh, huddled up in, uh, around the fire where it's warm, uh, worshiping God, we need to worship God. We need to keep the oil of God's fire lit every day of our lives. And our children need to know and our families need to know and our, our neighbors need to know that they are worshiping God. I want to encourage you. Let's serve the Lord. Our, our society is going downhill fast. We have all kinds of wickedness going on in high places. I pray that you would get serious with me about worshiping God, serving God, seeking God, listening to God before the next generation is completely lost. We're going to have a... Uh, we've got some food, and, and, and we will welcome anyone to stay with us. I don't know how much we got, but I'm sure it's always enough. If you want to stick around for the afternoon service, it'll be just as soon as we can finish lunch, we're going to get into uh, another sermon, and it'll be online. If you can't stay, you can go home and tune in on YouTube or uh, Skype or whatever, and that'll be fine, or watch it later. But um, this afternoon's message is going to come from Leviticus chapter 18, verses 1 through 5, and it's called The Lordship of God. I want to talk to you about how God should be the Lord of our life. And I hope that it'll be a help and it'll be kind of a, 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 just another aspect of what I've been preaching and teaching about this morning. But I want to invite you now to stand with me. Let's stand together, and we're going to have a song of invitation. And... Um, I want to invite you to respond to God this morning. And by that, I mean this. Going back to my first question, my opening questions, do you practice daily the presence of God? Is His presence real to you each and every day, all throughout the day? And if you would... Honesty with yourself and before the Lord. Again, it's not about me. I, I'm just here to present these thoughts to you and try to help you. Uh, these are the thoughts that I am going through. These are the things that I'm concerned about uh, in my life and in my family's life right now. If you, like me, realize, you know what? I am not practicing the presence of God as much as I should, as seriously as I should then I invite you with me to bow before the Lord, humble ourselves before the Lord, and say, God, thank you for pointing this out for me, uh, and help me to practice your presence every single day, uh, wherever I'm at, with, with whomever I am, uh, and, and whatever's going on in my life, help me not to forget or to not realize you are right there with me, and help me to keep filling the oil, and help me to keep lighting the fire and keeping it lit. There's a lot of efforts. There's a lot of things going on in our life. There are folks fighting for our Second Amendment right. 
There are folks fighting for uh, the rights of the unborn. All, all perfectly great things to, to fight for. You know what I'm here to fight for? The presence of God in your life and mine. I think that's more important than any of the other things, and I think they're important things. But the presence of God, if I, if I have my right to bear arms, and if I have my right to free speech, and if I have my right to all the other stuff, and if I don't use my right to worship God and practice His presence, what good are the other rights? So I invite you to, with me, bow before the Lord, humble ourselves before Him, and ask for His help to, be, to practice His presence the rest of our life, each and every day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, once again, we come to you and we're thankful for your grace and mercy. We, like many times before and, and many, many generations before, we have failed you. We have failed to practice your presence in our lives and before our families. And the results can be easily seen in our society. that They've drifted from you. In fact, in many cases, they've turned their backs or run from you. Many folks don't even realize that you are real. Many folks, sadly, don't even see the reality of your presence in my life, and I pray that you'd forgive me for allowing that. I failed to keep the lamp full of oil. I failed to keep the fire burning before you and before my neighbors. And Father, I pray that you'd help me to not only refill the lamp and keep it full, but keep the lights burning, keep the testimony of your presence and your power in my life before my children, before my wife, and before your people, before the, uh, the lost people in the world that you care so much about. Father, we're in danger of losing the next generation and in danger of losing our country as it is and was. And it all comes back to we haven't bowed and humbled ourselves and worshiped you. We have not acknowledged you. We haven't listened to you. We have not been sensitive to your voice and your will in our lives. And therefore, your blessings and your hand is, is off of us now. And the only way to change that and the only way to fix that is to bow and humble ourselves before you and get back in a right relationship with you and fill that lamp with oil and light that fire and keep it lit. Help us, Father. Forgive us and help us to get back in a right relationship with you before it's too late. I pray again for though anyone here that might not know your presence, might not sense your presence, might not know the salvation that's offered through Jesus Christ. If there's somebody here that's not saved, you know it. I don't, but I pray that you'd speak to their heart and help them to understand that there's something that they need from you and that they can come to me and my wife or anybody else and, and here that knows it and, and we can help them to see from your word how to be saved and how to have your presence in their life. We ask for your grace and your mercy and your help today, and we thank you for being so patient with us. We certainly don't deserve it, but we appreciate your grace and mercy and ask for your blessing now in our time of invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. 248 is our song. 284, excuse me. 248 is our song. I said it right the first.